Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Gordon Bell, Vice President of Marketing at Energis Corporation, and today we'll be hearing from Joe Ward, U.S. Sales Director and excuse me, U.S. Sales Director and Business Development at EPs, as well as Neeraj Sahajpal, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Business Development at Energis. Joe and Neeraj will be presenting this evening on how EPs and Energis are partnering to offer exciting new technology for energy harvesting applications. Uh, after uh, their presentation. We'll have some time to take many of your questions on the technology and how it may be implemented into your product applications. As with our past webinars, I'll kick things off with a brief presentation on Energis and our What Up Wireless Charging technology. Then I'm going to turn it over to Neeraj, who's going to go over uh, a little bit more in depth on the charging over the air and harvesting with our What Up Power Hub technology. Then moving to uh, Joe, who's going to present on EPs and the presentation of the technology that EPs has. Then we're going to cut to a demo. Uh, this is a video that we produced uh, just yesterday in our demo room uh, that shows our technology that we've uh, partnered with EPs on and how that technology works, uh, different applications, power levels, etc. And then we'll return back to Q&A. So during the webinar, we'd like to invite you to submit your questions that you might have by using the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, and at the end of our presentation in the Q&A section, we'll have time to answer most of those questions. Um, remember, our webinars are indeed meant to give technical and other details about our technology. Um, with that, we'll get started as folks are still filing in here. Um, so next slide, we'll talk a little bit about who we are as a company, Energis, uh, for those that are new uh, to what we do. Um, we are a uh, fabulous semiconductor company, about 50 employees based in San Jose. Um, we produce uh, technology using CMOS, gas and GAN, and that's for transmitter ICs, power amplifiers, receiver ICs, as well as beamforming and PA control. Uh, we do have an exclusive partnership with Dialog Semiconductor for sales and operations. And the first product became available from a company called Delight with a partnership in, with SK Telesis back in uh, 2019, after we received FCC and EU approvals. Uh, our customer model is that we provide full system reference design to not only consumer electronics companies, but also medical, industrial, uh, retail, uh, military and public safety and other IoT companies. Uh, we received our first FCC Part 18 certification for power at a distance. Um, and we've since received multiple uh, FCC certifications as well as uh, approvals throughout the uh, world. Uh, we are approved to ship in 112 countries, including the EU, Japan, and North America. And at last count, we have a 231 patents. Uh, next slide. Um, we talk about a new era and a new wireless charging 2.0. Uh, most of the folks on the call are going to be familiar with wireless charging, what we call 1.0, which is a coil-based charging technology you find in most of today's smartphones. Uh, it's been around for quite some time. A lot of us got used to that with uh, cordless or uh, cordless um, uh, toothbrushes. And you see that technology in phones, but hasn't really been adopted on a whole lot of other applications because of another, because of a number of uh, shortfalls on that. And part of it is typically the technology requires that the receiver device uh, has a large flat surface like the back of your phone. Um, and you place that flat surface and couple those uh, coils along uh, the charging surface and they kind of uh, provide charging through that mechanism. But you have to place it very specifically so that the coils can align together to provide the charging power. As you shrink the coils down because of smaller products and so forth, that finickiness with placement actually can sometimes become even more pronounced and even more problematic. You see devices that We'll use magnets to suck them down and place uh, in a very specific manner. Um, and then other products that simply just cannot use coils. Maybe they're too small. Uh, for instance, you can use our technology in devices as small as in the ear canal hearing aids, or it might be devices that don't have any, um, uh, any flat surfaces and the, the, the curved coils present a problem for that approach as well. Uh, in this diagram, we're showing the wireless charging 2.0 with a, a, a vision for us, which is the power hub transmitter off to the top, top right-hand side. 
and it's charging and providing power to numerous devices of different sizes, orientations, uh, battery needs, and so forth, and charging at different levels uh, based on the harvesting that the, those devices receive uh, from the power hub. And then the, the phone that's shown on top would be able to be charged in a much faster, higher power band. Um, and we're showing that as fast charging. That's what we anticipate is being able to charge multiple devices, both at contact as well as at a distance and charging not only multiple devices, but at multiple power rates. Uh, that's something that our solution provides the, the, uh, the, the uh, user experience with is not having a specific uh, device to charge each individual item, but actually just something like a power hub or power router to be able to provide power to those multiple devices at different power levels and different distances. We'll kind of show you that in the demo as well as in the slides that we're gonna go over in a short bit here. Um, next slide is, is our vision for how this might play out and how you might begin to see the technology, um, not only in the home, in the home office where you might see devices like earbuds, uh, remotes, smart glasses, smart watches, uh, uh, other things like that that are charging, but also um, in retail, um, specifically um, uh, the electronic paper or electronic shelf tags that are out. And uh, they wanna add more features to that, make them color screens, uh, be able to do even more than they might be currently doing. Um, and power has always been one of the gating issues for that uh, application. And that's what we're excited about kind of showing tonight with EPs. Um, also industrial applications, whether they're sensors, uh, or, or something else in factories and other autonomous areas where we can really provide quite a bit of power, whether it's robotics and manufacturing or some of the other things that are out there. We'll kind of touch on that a little bit tonight as well. But that's our vision for wireless charging 2.0. Next slide is uh, wireless charging our ecosystem on our roadmap. This is where I'm going to turn it over to Neeraj. Before he gets started, I do want to once again uh, ask that you send over your Zoom Q&A questions uh, to the Q&A function, and we'd be loving to uh, answer some of those questions later on at the end of this webinar. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Neeraj. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank Joe and EP's team uh, for joining us on the webinar. And hello, everyone. Um, today, we are going to talk uh, about what we, we are doing with our partners for the Farfield application primarily. And I'm very excited to report, uh, I think, a, a working solution that can actually be very useful for those kind of applications. Before we go into that, let me just share with you uh, how Energy sees the RF charging landscape, right? So as you know, uh, wireless charging is not a new technology. It, it goes through uh, a trifecta of um, uh, rational that how you can actually get to a product. Uh, number one is regulatory. Uh, regulatory approvals, uh, amount of power you can transmit, amount of power you can receive, and the frequency and all that, that plays a lot into what is possible today what, versus what is possible on the roadmap. Uh, in addition to that, the uh, commercial viability of uh, uh, technology is also is a, is a big factor. What I mean by that, it's very easy to show demonstration um, getting power at a distance. Um, you know, we have gone through that. Um, but it's it's one thing is showing a demonstration. The other thing is showing how a product can be commercially viable and ready for the approval and ready for uh, to be deployed and purchased by end consumer. And that's what uh, uh, is very, very big focus on urges. Keeping that in mind uh, from uh, very early, we have... Uh, we have um, identified how we would like to go in terms of launching the RF technology. So this chart is familiar to you, uh, but this is very important to kind of discuss and, uh, and anchor ourselves to how we see the market growing. Uh, on the X axis is the transmitter to receiver distance and the, and the Y axis is the receiver power back to the battery. So we have segmented the market in primarily three uh, zones, near field application, mid field application, or desktop application or far field or, or uh, higher than one meter application. What we are seeing is there is a significant demand uh, there in the far field application. Um, Midfield has a very interesting kind of application. Uh, basically anything in your, uh, within your one meter uh, is, is a very good target for gaming application or home IoT application or any kind of a desktop application. And near field definitely um, is, that's where the virus charging is today. 
in a big picture, there are very, very few solutions which are viable beyond the near field application. And uh, far field, uh, as you go for longer and longer, uh, the amount of power you can get in every band is going to be smaller and smaller. So you need to kind of figure out what strategy you want to, to have so that you're not transmitting a lot of power against the regulatory um, uh, regime. And, and then you're basically getting to a point that you can actually get meaningful power. So with that, um, let's uh, hold on. That, uh, let's talk about far field applications. Okay, so before going into the, the, the how we are implementing the solution, especially with our partner like EPs, let's understand what the opportunities exist for these applications. So there are primarily four vertical areas where, which we are focused on. Uh, number one is smart home office or smart building application. And these are the, the kind of sensors that are there in these buildings. And if you look into them, uh, uh, the sound of the detectors or smoke detectors going uh, again and again in, in your house, and that requires battery to be changed. And then um, sometimes they're not working. Nobody notices they're not working. So these kind of uh, needs are becoming very, very important. And in addition to that, how you manage the, the different functionalities inside a building based upon various sensors, uh, for example, closing the windows or opening the vents, all those can be done through sensors and those sensors needs to be charged. The utility of those sensors can be limited if you do not have a regular uh, charging uh, schedules. And now we are also getting a lot of uh, requirement regarding the motion detectors, uh, the people counters or smart bathrooms functionality so that you do not need to really uh, wait for somebody to report a problem or doing a regular maintenance. You can actually do it based upon the demand of uh, how much usage is happening. So we are seeing significant uh, uh, uptake in this segment right now. And then we are seeing the sensor needs to be charged. The sensor needs to be charged in a most cost-effective way in a larger charging zone. The second segment is the industriality. It's there for some time. And primarily it's in the areas of uh, sensors uh, that can monitor the production or they can monitor the functionality uh, of, of the, of the um, manufacturing. Uh, but there's a much bigger aspect going on in terms of robotics, where you would not like to tie yourself uh, based upon the wires so that robotics have a 360 degree operation. Um, industrial IoT is a very, very growing market and the amount of uh, uh, use cases that are coming is, is really uh, quite impressive. And then the, the third segment is retail. And the, we are seeing three kinds of opportunities in retail. Number one is the same sensor, same as the, the smart building. Retail also is looking for smarter ways to kind of manage their resources. And the second is the electronic shelf labels. Uh, we have announced our relationship with E-Ink on that. In fact, this design do support uh, another dimension to that use case. And then you have the uh, asset tracking, like either shopping carts or occupancy sensors. But there's something interesting coming now um, because of COVID. Um, people want to understand how many people are there in specific areas. Right now they are deploying people to, to do that. Uh, but imagine that there are occupancy sensors available that can monitor that and close doors and open doors and those kind of sensors need to be charged. Uh, and the fourth segment of interest to us is healthcare for these applications. Uh, similarly, asset tracking, building, any kind of uh, storage monitoring, patient tracking. And uh, I think these are the key areas which, where we are seeing an uptake for the wireless charging application. In addition to that, uh, defense and the, and the uh, government services is, is seeing a lot of need at this point in time. Drone is a uh, very good example of that where, where you can actually charge smaller devices uh, like that. So uh, the point here is uh, that there's significant application that they, they are almost asking for that, how can you provide a longer life to their operation? How can you add more features to, uh, uh, to them? Because they may be limited because of the battery. And uh, there are a lot of ways uh, um, they are being charged today. Uh, primarily it is the, either through a wired connection or through a, some kind of a battery 
or even um, uh, ambient harvesting is being explored. For example, 2.4 gig or 5 gig. The, the challenge with the ambient harvesting is that uh, when you go toward the ambient harvesting, the amount of power that you can actually harvest is very, very small. It does have a value for certain very, very low power application. But uh, the other way to look at it is if you want to really get best out of your sensor networks or you want to get best out of your other application, especially the video type of application, you need a, a, a source of power that is reliable that you can always count on. The ambient harvesting, the challenge can be you may have the, uh, the uh, power available uh, to harvest or you may not have because you do not own that source of that. So we really believe the uh, the uh, market is moving toward the large part of applications are moving towards uh, what they call the uh, the dedicated uh, harvesting, where you deploy very low cost uh, transmitter networks, and then they are providing charge to multiple devices. Okay, so uh, let me just give some more details about the what our harvest technology look like. And then uh, we will go in more detail about how we are leveraging EP's strength uh, to provide the solution. So today, the uh, we believe in a uh, that the the deployment has to be commercially viable and cost effective. So we have extended our power hub technology, which is a single PA architecture, um, to actually provide a charging zone. Um, this is just not a simple broadcast technology. Actually, it has significant antenna technology that can control where the where the power is, and we also have a lot of control in terms of how much power we need to send based upon where the receivers are. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are able to provide up to ten feet, ten milliwatt of power using uh, the technology we have, and then you can imagine at fifteen feet or twenty feet, we can actually provide. Um, a reasonable power at that point of time. Uh, we can charge multiple devices. Uh, we, we can have multiple transmitter um, in a topology of a, a mesh architecture so that we can increase the area coverage at the lowest cost point. And then we can smart, uh, we can schedule the uh, device power utilization based upon where the device is, uh, how much power it needs and all those kind of things. So from a power at a distance perspective, if I summarize, uh, it's a low cost transmitter, uh, multiple of them providing the, the larger uh, power uh, ch charging zone. The use case, as I mentioned, uh, we are very, very active in the smart home market, industrial IoT market, and the retail market. And we continue to expand into the hospitality and the healthcare uh, market to add more solutions. And the deployment, uh, from a deployment standpoint, wide area coverage is the number one requirement from the, these customers. They would not like to have a small area of, of operation. The second requirement is that they would like to have minimal installation cost and they will not like to have maintenance. Uh, it all points down to that whatever a solution it is, it has to be commercially viable, not from the cost standpoint, but also from a perspective that is simple to install, easy to maintain, and it does not require a large area to, to, to install. Um, from Energis and EP's perspective, this technology is available today. Um, if you're interested in this technology, please reach out to us or EP's. We can provide the dev kit to you. And we have the RF and the antenna expertise uh, where we can actually help you take the best advantage of our solutions. And then we, we continue to work on regulatory certification and uh, we are working toward the standardization of this technology as part of Airflow Alliance. And the solution has been designed with the scalability in mind. So uh, the original power hub was approved at 5.5 watt, but we have solution that can take us to 10 watt, 20 watt, and so on. Our, our primary motivation is that we will continue to follow the trajectory of what is possible in the regulatory and the, and the technology and continue to provide incremental solution from there. Okay, so this is the block diagram. Uh, you you might see uh, a lot of familiarity with all the current solution we have. Um, on the transmitter side, um, we have DA4100, which is the heart of our transmitter technology that provides the control and the PA control uh, as well as the authentication. 
Then it goes to a single PA structure, which is a GAN PA uh, 3913M, and then a PA control that allows us to control what amount of power we want to send based upon uh, the devices or keep out zone and all that. It goes to a single antenna. And if you can see, this is the lowest cost structure. And that is where I think we are very, very different to our competition. Not only we have the beamforming technology, but we also have highly differentiated uh, single PA uh, and single antenna architecture. And this, this antenna design is very, very unique. It can allow us to manage how far we want to send the power based upon the application. It goes to the antenna on the receiver side, and then it goes to a, a receiver. We, I'm gonna talk about that shortly. And then DA2210 has four receiver paths, so you can do the diversity or you can add them for higher power. And then it goes into AEM30940 from EPs, which is basically the PMIC charging solution and can do a super cap charging. It can also do a battery based upon how customer would like to use. Most of the application are moving towards super cap. Only the, uh, the applications like video where you require more power, they, they would like to have smaller battery. And that's where our battery partnership is coming handy too, which can allow us to have uh, a lower rate charging. The harvesting system development kit uh, includes a transmitter. Um, the form factor is very similar to Power Hub. Uh, but you can actually put this into any form factor. You can put it uh, uh, just above the door for a smart lock kind of implementation or uh, on the roof for a, for a smart um, bathroom implementation. Or, so the applications are just, uh, the possibilities are pretty endless. And then uh, we have a small uh, receiver board um, that has, I'm gonna talk about that board shortly. Um, it allows you to, uh, harvest the energy from the transmitter and then provide to various options available on the development board. You can evaluate the technology and also take this design to uh, your implementation also. We provide the complete uh, TX receiver schematic and layout files, antenna design files, and mechanical files so that you can really ramp up uh, your implementation. We provide the firmware SDK. We have implementation for multiple uh, of, um, of the BLE chip. And then if you need a specific antenna simulation done for your custom design, we can even provide that. So as you can see, uh, this, this kit has been put together with a, with a dual uh, purpose. If you would like to evaluate the technology, you can quickly evaluate in the use case you would like to see. In addition to that, we also have pieces in, uh, uh, in place so that you can take it and implement it very quickly for your uh, design. Okay, so let's talk about harvesting uh, system. So this board, as you can see, the, um, uh, I'm gonna start from, there's a dialog RF to DC, triple two, three, uh, which basically uh, provides the, the RF to DC power. Then we have the dialog low power BLE here. We can use any other BLE also. Then we have the harvesting PMIC, and then it, we have the support for E, ultra low power paper display. Then there are some sensors. We're gonna see them in the demo shortly. And if you could see, this is providing a, an option that you can do a display uh, kind of a application with e -Ink. You can actually do a sensor application with the onboard sensors. And there are three paths available that allows you to have all the way from minus 10 to plus 30 dBm of, uh, uh, of the receive power. That gives a very, very strong uh, uh, option to, to really go through a very low power harvesting to all the way to the normal uh, RF power charging. It has onboard uh, BLE and it can actually provide a external BLE antenna or onboard antenna. You can also hook up your external harvesting antenna. So you could see the options available for you to create a system based upon your application. Okay, on the firmware side, uh, we have a significant uh, um, the, the, the control available through our BLE software. On the transmitter side, you can control the power, you can control how the hardware turn on and off. Different charging algorithms are available, uh, how you want to handle multiple receivers, how you want to prioritize, all that is available. And it, in addition to that, we have sensors and associated algorithm for human detection to implement the keep out zone if you want to increase the power further. All of this actually gives a very good framework 
to, to, to help you design your application. And our team is always available to help you achieve what you're looking for. On the receiver side, uh, we have the ADC monitoring so that you can monitor the charge rate and how the charge is coming. Uh, based on that, you can do power control decision, and then you can also uh, understand the different sensors which are available on board and any kind of uh, uh, the firmware update that is needed over OTA that is also possible. Today, we support not only Dialog on the receiver side, we support Nordic, ST Micro, Broadcom, and OnSemi. And on the mobile app, you can actually take it, uh, do your own scan, and actually get uh, either monitor the charge rates or different kind of charging behavior, but you can also take it to the next level and take a subset of this and provide it to your customer or integrate with your customer app. So if you can see from a hardware, software, all the way from BLE to the mobile app, we have a complete set of tools available to really jumpstart your development in this zone. Okay. Uh, the one aspect is technology, as I mentioned, the, the second aspect is the regulatory. So we have the regulatory available in North America. Um, it can go all the way to 5.5 watt EIRP. And then we are in the process of getting European and United Kingdom uh, approval, and then we will get to Japan, Korea, and China. Uh, and because our technology is very scalable, we can go from small power to high power. We'll continue to increase the power while following all the regulatory requirements. That allows us to have a very, very differentiated solution with the same receiver. Same receiver can go from a four watt EARP to higher power when they are available. There will be some limit in terms of how much power it can get based upon the design, but that limit is far, far more than what typical application in, in zone seven and eight are uh, requiring. With that, I'm going to hand off to Joe. Uh, let me just bring that. And while you're bringing that up, Neeraj, I wanted to just uh, ask uh, the attendees to go ahead and send over their questions using the Zoom Q&A function. Um, I'm going to switch over here so Joe can present slides. Um, but once again, if you have questions on the technology, how that technology works, uh, how to get a, a developer kit or any other kind of question, uh, please reach out to us right now using the Q&A function. And I'll turn it back over to Neeraj and Joe. Thanks, Gordon. And thanks, Neeraj. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. You have an amazing product and we are very happy to be a part of it. Uh, it's our, our energy wireless charging at, at long distances. It's very innovative, and uh, again, we're very pleased to be a part of that. So uh, let me tell you, my name is Joe Ward. I'm uh, Director of Sales and, and Business Development for EPs in North America. Uh, I want to just take a few minutes here to tell you about who we are and what we have and how we fit into the equation, and um, um, and, and then we're, I'm going to turn it back over to the, the Energist team for a, a quick demo and then the Q&A. So uh, just a quick slide on, on, on the company. We're EPs, which stands for Electronic Portable Energy Autonomous Systems. Uh, we're a fabulous semiconductor company. We push the limits of device autonomy and edge computing. We're the most advanced self-powered edge computing company tackling the world's problems in, in many different market segments. We have a uniquely combined experience in energy harvesting, edge computing, computer vision, and ultra low power semiconductors. It's, uh, the company was founded back in, in 2014. We have 32 employees are, are growing fast, 15 patents. We have an off, a headquarters are in Belgium. Uh, we have an office in Switzerland and then the North America headquarters are in Palo Alto, California. And we have distributors and sales representatives uh, in most countries around the world. Next slide. Uh, our mission is to provide scalable and sustainable solutions to enable massive deployment of fully autonomous edge computing devices. How do we do that? We do it by harvesting, harvesting energy from the environment, which allows most of our customers to remove the batteries from their applications. If not, they certainly can get much longer battery life, but we also consume less by having very low energy devices that uh, have, have use extremely low power. This enables seamless power-driven software development by delivering intelligent and easy solutions. The next slide. <clears throat> So our, our core competence is in low power. And obviously we uh, have uh, adapted that into energy harvesting. We have a, a family of power management ICs 
and we were about to release a family of, of ultra low power MCUs, micros, but uh, uh, we are using one of our power management ICs in the solution with Energis. And in the, the bottom, you see a block diagram of a typical edge device. And that's very similar to the architecture shown in Naraj's slide where he, down in the bottom right-hand corner where he had his receiver device. Our, our device fits in the power management quadrant of that edge device. We manage the power between you know, the sensing and the communication and the processing. Next slide. So th this is the family of devices uh, of power management ICs. We call them ambient energy managers. And we have one device for each energy source. So you can see the device on the left covers for solar or photovoltaic uh, applications. The middle device is for thermal. And the, the device on the right covers vibration and RF. Those are both AC sources, so they do require external rectifiers, and of course RF requires matching network. That is the device selected by Energis for their solution, and they take care of all the implementation for you, so you don't have to worry about the matching network or rectifier or any of that. The next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick example of, 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 of some of the uh, applications for, uh, the next slide, please. <laughs> there you go. Um, of our of our AEMs, we uh, obviously there's so many different applications that can consider energy harvesting, anything that's battery operated. Uh, but uh, this is just a quick snapshot of where we've been implemented. Um, you can skip and skip ahead. There we go. Okay, so just a bit on energy harvesting. Uh, you know what is it? It's it's basically re ultimately replacing a battery from uh, any bad wireless device. And there's a lot of those devices out there. But what's really uh, grown recently is the number of IoT devices that are out there. They're deployed in volume to sense, to measure, to monitor, and to track. And they're in very high volumes. And obviously, these all have batteries in them. And replacing the battery is a major headache for these people because batteries never last as long as they're supposed to. And of course, they never fail at the same time. And so when these uh, IoT devices are scaled into thousands and tens, thousands and hundreds of thousands, replacing the batteries and disposing of the batteries is a nightmare. So energy harvesting offers a solution to those problems and removes the maintenance and cost issues. <clears throat> so there's a lot of reasons, uh, fairly obvious reasons of why you would wanna do energy harvesting to reduce that maintenance cost, to extend the lifetime of the product, to reduce your storage volume, but also people sometimes underestimate the ability to add features if you, um, don't have the power budget based on a battery. If you have energy harvesting, you can often receive and transmit more often or add extra capabilities into your sensor. Um, so again, what is energy harvesting? You know, it's, it's taking that ambient source and transforming the energy into electrical power and, and putting it into a storage element to store for, you know, for later use. And uh, there's different ambient sources, but what we have worked on with, with energy is on the RF side. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so what, what, what Energis has done is taken that RF signal and converted it to energy through our device. And we extract the maximum power from that signal and we're able to do an ultra low cold start. So we can start at very low levels of energy that are picked up through the RF signal. And we have extremely en efficient energy transfer to make sure that the device is efficient and we, we maintain as much energy as possible through the circuit to your hardware. Uh, next slide. So, um, you know, why why do you need the the AEM or the you know the power management IC there? It's to make sure you're getting the maximum power from the harvester, to make sure that you're able to do an ultra low cold start, so you can get this device going and 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 get your device working from very low levels of energy, and to protect the storage element. Our device is able to. Uh, make sure that the, there's no overcharge or over discharge on the storage element. And then also to supply regulated voltages to your application. We have two LDOs in our device to make sure you get a high voltage and a low voltage to your, your application. And again, a lot of this is, is detail that you as a user don't need to know uh, when you use the energy system because they develop the complete solution for the receiver. And this is all, they take advantage of all these capabilities of our device, but you as the user are, uh, don't have to worry about these, these intimate details. Next slide. 
So just real quick on the product family, again, there's no software involved with these devices. They're easy to use with configuration pins selected on the type of energy source and the type of energy storage that you're using. Um, one more slide, there we go. <laughs> and, and just to summarize some of the features I was saying in the device, um, it, it, you can just uh, advance and it'll, the animations will come in. Or, so the, the device has the ultra low cold start, 380 millivolts is all that's required to get the device to operate. Global leakage of 400 mil, of nanoamps, 400 nanoamps, which is extremely efficient. Uh, we have um, storage protection. So the device, the storage element doesn't get overcharged uh, uh, or over discharged. We have the maximum PowerPoint tracking capability and we have two LDOs that supply the high voltage and low voltage to your hardware device. Uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> no problem, there we go. So one last snapshot of the portfolio. Again, the device that the Energist is using is the device to the right, the AEM 3930940. And then if you go to my last slide, I'll just dive into a little bit detail about that device. Uh, you can just see the block diagram. Again, the, the, on the top left, the matching network and the rectifier is all taken care of through Energis. The device does ultra low cold start. It has a maximum power point tracking, a very efficient boost, a buck circuit, two LDOs. It can manage a primary battery and it manages the storage elements. There are seven external passives that are required. The device itself is in a QFN28, but it's a very efficient device, very, uh, very unique, and it, it handles multiple different frequencies. and. We're very pleased that uh, Energis has implemented this into their system and, uh, and it provided a, you know, an incredible solution for doing long range energy charging, wireless charging. That's it for me. I'll pass it back over to Neeraj and Gordon and you can, uh, I guess we're gonna show the demo. Yeah, so up next we're gonna show the demo, but once again, uh, before, as we get set up for that, uh, I wanted to ask folks to send over their questions to the Q&A function as we have some time tonight to answer some of those questions. And they're just getting the demo set up here. Let's see here. All right, Neeraj, you got that coming. Just bear with me here. Sorry guys, just give me one minute. I'm just sure. setting up the, the video. No worries. Yeah, we just filmed this video uh, yesterday in our demo lab. As Neeraj mentioned in our webinar earlier today, uh, definitely a little bit different with COVID-19 uh, protocols still in place uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, we have quite a few folks that uh, are able to help out and uh, got that uh, going. But um, let's see here. Okay. We don't see your, uh, there we go. Can you see it? I, I see a black screen, uh, but I don't see, why don't you go ahead? Yep, there you go. Welcome to the demonstration of our latest active harvesting charging technology, which allows us to power multiple devices at a variety of distances using the EP's PMIC technology within a WhatUp enabled receiver and our latest WhatUp power hub transport. This is an ideal solution for industrial, retail, medical, and IoT devices. I'd like to now introduce Caesar Johnston, COO and EVP of Engineering here at Energist Corporation. Hello, I'm Cesar Johnston, COO and EVP of Engineering at Energist Corporation. Today, I will be showing you a demonstration of our, our active harvesting system that utilizes our technology pair with EP's technology. The active harvesting system consists of a transmitter that we will turn on as part of the demo and two receivers, as I mentioned before. The first receiver is positioned at two meters. The second receiver is positioned at four meters. And each one of the receivers has a multimeter that is there for the purposes of showing that the received power is being received. Our power hub transmitter is controlled by a GUI via a DLE interface. And we're gonna turn it on. You will notice that the red LED now goes green, showing that it's on. And therefore, we, now, we are now transmitting wireless power across the room. Our, our harvesting receivers include a super cap value that is displayed on the multimeter as a voltage level. 
And you, you can see right now that the voltage is moving, meaning it's charging as, as the power is on. And internal to the harvesting receiver, we have placed three sensors. One sensor for temperature measurements, one sensor for humidity measurements, and a third sensor for lighting purposes. You can see on the GUI that we are now receiving the values of this room's temperature and humidity via our DME interface. Uh, now we're going to turn on the flashlight and point that into the harvesting receiver. And you will notice that now the lux value changes, showing that the system is up and running. These are two energy boards that have been designed for the transmitter and for the receiver. The transmitter board is used in the power hub system. It includes our specialized semiconductor devices, the 4100 device, which is a transmitter chip, the 3921 device, which is a control chip for the power amplifier. And this is the power amplifier that provides the five and a half watt conductive power that is sent into the antenna. This board itself also includes a BLE device by Dialog. The receiver board includes the RF paths, in this case three that we have, and we are using the 2223 in this particular path. It connects to the EP's PIMIC device, provides power to the subsystem. The subsystem includes the BLE chip, the high dialog, sensor devices, namely for humidity, lighting, and temperature and an optional interface for, for a display. Thank you for attending our demonstration of the energy harvesting system. We have specific technology that is unique and has been optimized for the purposes of wireless power transmission. And we are very happy to also partner with EPs in the case of our receivers. Great, thank you. So we're just uh, collecting up some of the questions that we have from the the audience here for the webinar tonight as we get to uh, back to the slides. Um, if you have not already, go ahead and send your questions to the Q&A uh, part of Zoom. And we'll kind of start off, let's see here. Um, okay, let's see. So Joe, we'll have you answer the first question. Uh, question is, how do uh, folks get a hold of a developer kit um, from either EPs or Energis, but uh, how, how can they get their hands on a developer kit? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, you can reach out to either our companies through our website. Uh, I, we have a, a, a sales support link on our website, which is www.e-peas.com. And, and uh, you'll be able to uh, get get access to anybody at the company there, that, and, and just ask, if you inquire on the Energist Dev Kit, we'll be able to help you. And I, I know that Energist has the same uh, on their site. Great, great. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Nerds. I think we talked about this one. We get this question quite a lot. Um, how do you deal, or how does the technology deal with a completely depleted battery, including the battery for BLE? Yeah, so um, I think we we have developed a specific protocols. If, uh, if basically it's a dead battery scenario. Um, uh, first of all, if you're managing the receiver to your transmitter network, that will not happen because uh, you'll always find a receiver is uh, connected to the transmitter through BLE and it can actually send a message. So. But the first test is that you will never see that. This is not a consumer device that you have in your pocket. You forgot to put it on a charger and now the battery is there. These are connected devices in the sense that they are in a, uh, they've been deployed in a network uh, where the sensors are uh, in, in a charging zone where transmitter knows when those devices can go uh, battery dead and they will uh, make sure pretty intelligently that they can monitor that and do that. Even if that happens, then we have the process where we can actually light that up for a certain time so that the, the BLE is enabled. 
Okay. And how many sensors can be charged with this technology? That's kind of a, a broad question. Yeah. So uh, there is no such limit, right? So the now when we say how many sensors can charge, it really depends upon what your topology network is. Uh, let me give an example of a you know a smart uh, uh, washroom uh, application where you might have a paper dispenser, soap dispensers, and you know people counter and all other kind of sensors. They are they are actually distributed in the larger area. So by using one or two transmitter, you can cover them, and then. Uh, now they are more controlled by the the deployment of those sensors. But if you have a use case where you have to put uh, multiple of those sensors close to each other, for example, the industrial applications, then we can do that. So there is no such limitation from a um, from a technology standpoint. Um, they are more limited by your physical deployment of the sensor network. So scales according to need, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, this person understands that regulatory approval pretty much typically determined by um, issues gating on the transmitter device, but are there any special requirements on the receiver or the energy steam, or the, excuse me, are there any special requirements on the receiver or energy harvesting terminal to pass certification? Uh, so the, you're right, uh, the, uh, the primarily it is driven by the transmitter characteristic. There are some uh, tests that are done on the receiver side also. Um, uh, it depends upon how the use case is. Uh, if that requires a SAR approval, then you need to do that, which is the absorption measured at the receiver. And then the second thing is the any kind of coexistence test required because of how you have designed your receiver. So whether the 900 megahertz will have any challenge to work co-work with uh, any kind of other component on the device. So those are the two areas where you need to make sure you pass those tests. Okay, another question. Uh, this is more generic in mind, but uh, we noted earlier in the presentation that we have uh, energy has technology in, in three uh, CMOS, gas, and GAN. And why is that? Why is the need for the different technologies in, in, uh, in what we're doing? So um, if, if you see from the, the, the transmitter technology, you have to have very uh, low cost. So one vector where the technology, different technology is needed is the cost. The second vector is the power. Uh, if you need very high power, CMOS is not the right technology uh, for the high efficiency device. And when I say higher power means anything above one to two watt, especially our CMOS technology goes all the way 1.2 watt. Uh, the cost of the GAN uh, power amplifier technology is higher, uh, but it actually gives a very, very high efficiency in a higher power. So applications are more to a higher power. For example, our power hub technology uses GAN power amplifier because it goes to five watt. Now it can scale to 10, 20, and so on. CMOS is very good technology for lower power uh, transmitter um, as for the power amplifier is concerned. On the other side, the gas is... Uh, uh, is very good technology for higher power on the receive side. And the CMOS, we use it for very low power application. For the zone seven and eight, primarily we are focused on the CMOS because that uh, really covers the range of uh, power which uh, applications are looking for. Great, this one's for Joe. Uh, Joe, you'd mentioned earlier in your uh, slides that EPs is based in Belgium. And this person is wondering if you have uh, support in Asia, either uh, through email or if you have Asian local market support. Yes, yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, we have sales representatives in Asia. Um, if again, if you inquire into our website, you can get the contact information there. Um, uh, but yeah, the answer to the question is yes, we have uh, sales support in Asia. Perfect. Thank you. Um, that is it for the questions. I think we got through them. Um, any other final comments? I think we're good. Uh, thank you guys for, for attending. Joe, thanks once again for being available to uh, participate in the second webinar uh, for a lot, lot of uh, partners in Asia request that we do a second webinar. And definitely appreciate you being uh, available to us. Nearest, thank you as always. Uh, this concludes our March 2021 webinar. We'd like to thank you for sharing your time this evening or this morning based on where you're at. And we look forward to having you join us again for our April webinar. 
Uh, more details on that webinar will be posted to our social channels and will soon be available on our page, which is at energist.com. Once again, thank you all for participating.